live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Two years ago, I made a video on Brett Favre when he was the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers and was playing a game at home at Lambeau Field against the New York Giants in 2004. You can learn more about what happened in that game by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, that game is notable for the only touchdown of the game that the Packers scored, because in the third quarter of this loss, Favre threw a 28-yard touchdown pass to Javon Walker, while he had a concussion. He had a bad concussion, came out of the game for one play, put himself back in, and threw a touchdown pass. And I want to emphasize, this is incredibly stupid. Even though it worked, it's stupid. Knowing what we know about concussions, to do that is ridiculous. And at no point did I ever try and make it seem like Favre did a cool thing. You could get brain damage that will last for the rest of your life if you try something like this. Let me be very clear. If a player gets a concussion, you have to take him out of the game. And thank goodness that concussion protocol is where it is now. As even though there might still be some work to do, it is leagues better than what it was at the start of the 21st century. Case in point, this man right here. This is Seattle Seahawks head coach Mike Holmgren, and in a 2000 game against the Oakland Raiders, after his quarterback, John Kitna, got a concussion, he decided that it was a good idea to leave him in the game. In essence, without saying it directly, his message was, screw that. Who cares that he's concussed badly? He gives us the best chance to win this game, and we need to win this game. When you hear about what Holmgren did during this game with his quarterback situation, especially considering what we know today, it is truly stomach-turning and disgusting. Because Holmgren decided that it would be best for his team if he put John Kitna's entire life in jeopardy. And this is the story behind what has to be the stupidest and most dangerous quarterback decision in the over 45-year history of the Seattle Seahawks franchise. Before I talk about the decision in question, and what was said after the game that just feels disgusting to even think about, we need some context to understand the importance of the game, as well as what was transpiring during this game. Will it in any way defend Mike Holmgren for playing his quarterback with a concussion? Absolutely not. However, it will help us to get a look into his messed up mindset. It's October 22, 2000. It's week 8 of the NFL season, and as we're near the halfway point, we have a big AFC West battle on our hands between the Oakland Raiders and the Seattle Seahawks. You know it's big because Greg Gumbel and Phil Simms, the number one team at CBS, was on the call for this one. Not sure why that was the case, especially when you had a 500 Bills team against an undefeated Vikings team earlier in the day, but that's besides the point. The point is that this game for Seattle is the definition of a must-win game. If they do not go on the road and upset the Raiders, who are favored in this one by more than a touchdown, then their season is over. Seattle enters this game with an abysmal 2-5 record, so if you drop to 2-6 and, and fall to potentially three games back of a playoff spot behind a bunch of teams in the conference, then barring a miracle, you can kiss your season goodbye. And if the Seahawks were going to have any chance at winning this game, then they needed a great performance out of this guy right here, starting quarterback Brock Heward. The good news for the Seahawks was that Heward was coming off of his best game ever as a pro, when the previous week against the Indianapolis Colts, even though the Seahawks lost 37-24, it had nothing to do with him, as he threw three touchdown passes, completed over 73% of his passes for 226 yards, and had a passer rating of 121.6. He was carrying some great momentum going into this game, and the Seahawks saw no reason why he couldn't keep that going against the Raiders, as he looked for his first win ever as a starting quarterback. The bad news for the Seahawks was that this did not happen in the slightest bit. Heward struggled heavily in this one, going 4 for 12, completing just 33% of his passes, throwing for 64 yards, no touchdowns and one interception, and posting a passer rating of 17.4, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. The number of passes completed, the completion percentage, the number of touchdowns thrown, the number of interceptions thrown, and the passer rating were all the worst single-game totals of his career at the time. It was truly a day to forget. However, he cannot be fully blamed for this atrocious performance, as on the final play of the first quarter, this happened, and he was sacked on the second down by Reagan Upshaw for a loss of two. And on this play, he got a concussion. Heward stayed in the game for another drive, 
and they had no reason to suspect that he was concussed, as he didn't take a jarring shot or stay on the ground after the sack. But the team quickly realized after the end of the third drive and the fourth drive, when he was missing wide open guys, that something was up, and something was not right. They were going to have to take Heward out, and put in the backup quarterback, otherwise known as the man that they benched to give Heward the job in the first place. Enter the man that was the team's starting quarterback throughout the 1999 season, none other than John Kitna. Oddly enough, this is not the first time I've done a video about John Kitna playing in a game that he had no business playing in because of an injury and because of horrible mismanagement on the part of the coaching staff. As I talked about a game he had in 2001 when he was a member of the Cincinnati Bengals playing against the New York Jets, where he shouldn't have seen the field, but somehow did. If you want to learn more about that, click the card in the upper right corner. As for this game, Kitna's got a tough job in front of him. You're down 21-3. to You need to make up an 18-point deficit of three possessions coming off the bench, which is going to be tough, but it's doable. You have two and a half quarters to do it, so you've got some time. And at the two-minute warning, Kitna tries to lead a drive that starts inside Oakland territory with great field position. The goal here is simple. Cut it to two possessions. A few five-yard passes to Itula Mili gives the Seahawks a first down and puts them on the brink of field goal range. Then, Kitna finds Daryl Jackson for a gain of nine yards, putting the ball at the 26-yard line. And after Kitna's next pass falls incomplete, on third down, Kitna decides that he's going to do it himself, and falls forward on a quarterback sneak for a gain of one, picking up the first down and keeping the drive alive. There is just one small problem. On the sneak, sure enough, Kitna got concussed. It's not clear exactly where he got concussed on this play or how it happened, but he did. At this point, the Seahawks seem to be screwed. You have to go to your third-string quarterback, Matt Lytle, who had never thrown a pass before, who wasn't entirely impressive in college, and who wasn't even a starter when he played in NFL Europe. But you have to go to him. It's an incredibly unlucky and unfortunate situation to lose both of your quarterbacks in the first half, but you have to get Kitna out of there. I know there's a rule at this time, where if you put your emergency quarterback or your third string quarterback in the game before the end of the third quarter, then you can't put the first or second stringer back into the game. So if you go with Lytle, you can't put Kitna back in. This was the rule that came into place in the 2010 NFC Championship between Chicago and Green Bay. But you have to make this move. For the sake of Kitna's health, and for the betterment of the team, you have to take Kitna out of this game. Well... Guess what the Seahawks and head coach Mike Holmgren decided to do? As you could tell by the title of this video, they did not do that. They left Kitna in. And the results were horrifying, and might be the biggest black eye on Mike Holmgren's entire coaching career. To the surprise of absolutely no one, Kitna played horribly. I can't blame Kitna for playing poorly. The man was literally concussed. And I don't care who you are, where you're from, or what you did. You're not playing well with a concussion. He didn't throw a single pass for the rest of the game that went more than 10 yards down the field. Everything was kept short, as he didn't even try to stretch the field. His ball velocity was nowhere where it needed to be, as he was throwing floaters and ducks all day, to the point where passes he'd usually complete were able to be broken up by defenders who had time to jump in front of the ball. He fumbled the ball twice, and fumbled it on the easiest thing in the world, fumbling it on the center exchange on the snap. You rarely see quarterbacks do this, and Kitna did it twice in one half because his head was all messed up. The stats might not look horrible, as they're fairly mediocre or below average. Kitna went 11 for 18 with 85 yards and a passer rating of 72.7. But this is one of those games where the numbers lie tremendously, because Kitna looked terrible and looked after that quarterback sneak where he got the concussion like he had no business being on the field, which makes sense, because he was literally concussed. The Raiders won this game 31-3, but afterwards, all the talk was about what the heck was going on in Seattle, and why Kitna wasn't removed from the game despite all the evidence. And it's truly infuriating. Because it would be one thing if the Seahawks didn't know that he had a concussion. It would be one thing if Kitna didn't disclose this information to the team. The Seahawks had no idea what was happening, and they just didn't do their due diligence. Again, concussion protocol prior to the 2010s was absolute garbage. But do you want to know the disgusting part about all this? The part that makes me ill and makes me wonder, for as great of a coach as Mike Holmgren is, how he escaped public backlash for this? 
and how people don't really remember this more than two decades later, the Seahawks knew. The Seahawks freaking knew that he had a concussion. The Seahawks knew that he was struggling out there. And they decided not to do anything about it. One play after Kitna got concussed on the quarterback sneak, the Seahawks called timeout. But they didn't call timeout for the purposes of stopping the clock. As quarterbacks coach Mike Shepard said, the reason we took the timeout was because Kitna didn't seem to understand the play that was sent in. And it wasn't because of a miscommunication between the coaching staff and the quarterback, because those things happened. It was because Kitna, because he was concussed, physically could not remember the play call or understand it. Holmgren said, John was able to play and remember rudimentary things, which is a fancy way of saying that he was able to remember extremely basic things, but not the nuances necessary to be on a football field playing quarterback. He then added, I try not to put him at risk too much. I try not to put him at risk too much. I'm sorry, what? You try not to put him at risk? You left him in a football game when he had a concussion. You left him hanging out to dry in the most violent and physical sport out there while his brain was all mangled. You want to know how not to put your quarterback at risk when he's dealing with a concussion? It's really simple. You don't play him. You don't freaking play him. You don't have a drive in the third quarter where every single play is a passing play because that actually happened. I mean, you don't have him throw, period. But to actually have a drive where literally every single play was a design pass is absurd. Holmgren even said during the game, John was a little out of it. Gee, you think? No crap he was a little out of it. He had a freaking concussion. Blaming the quarterback and placing any blame on Kitna whatsoever, which is what it sounds like you're doing for being out of it, is absolutely absurd. And when asked why Holmgren had the guts to do this and leave a concussed quarterback out there to risk brain damage, he said that he thought about making a change. He really did, but just didn't want to because Kitna gave them the best chance at winning. How thoughtful. As Holmgren said, I thought about putting Lytle in, but if I put him in the third quarter, that was it. We were running the ball okay, and I thought we could get away with that. Obviously, I was wrong. Translation, I knew Kitna Woods concussed. I just didn't want to make the change. And that's not even getting into the fact that Holmgren had complete control of the roster in 2000. So if he's saying that he would rather play his backup quarterback, who's concussed, and doesn't remember anything but the absolute basics over his healthy third-string quarterback, then why is the third stringer even on the roster? What is the point of having Matt Lytle on the roster as an emergency quarterback if you don't, you know, put him in the game in an emergency? Do you know what the word emergency means? I mean, it's just awful, no matter how you slice it. And it gets even worse when you hear what Kitna had to say about this. Because when you're listening to Kitna's quotes, Remember that the Seahawks and Mike Holmgren had full knowledge that this was happening and chose not to do anything about it. Kitna said the day after the game, when he was feeling a bit better on what it was like playing on Sunday, it kind of scrambled my brain a little bit. I was pretty good with the stuff we'd run forever, but the newer things, I had no clue about. Some of the guys said in the huddle, I was even more funny than I thought it was. Of course, the coaches are talking to me in my helmet, so it was kind of like a cartoon where the guy is talking to somebody who isn't there. I'm like, I don't know how to run that play. It's scary. So good job, Seahawks. This was the man you had playing at quarterback. This was the man that you left in the game because he gave you the best chance to win, which not only failed miserably, but jeopardized his health in the process. And you would think that Mike Holmgren would have been mortified by this and would have learned his lesson from this. However, a decade later, when Holmgren was with the Cleveland Browns, Quarterback Colt McCoy got hit helmet-to-helmet by James Harrison on this play right here, and he wasn't even examined for a concussion. So maybe that saying about a zebra not being able to change its stripes is completely true. I don't think anyone can deny that Mike Holmgren was a great head coach. Three Super Bowl appearances, turning around two franchises that were struggling before he arrived, a Super Bowl win, 161 career wins, just three losing seasons in 17 years, with that 2000 season being one of them, and a career-winning percentage of just under 60%. He's regarded as the best head coach in NFL history that isn't in the Hall of Fame, and you have to figure that his time will eventually come for getting inducted. But one thing was abundantly clear after this game in 2000. Mike Holmgren did not care about the health of his players, and he was willing to put your life on the line if it meant he thought he had a better chance of winning this game. 
because God only knows what would happen if this happened in 2022. Truly disgusting. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.